COVID transmission in Massachusetts schools was, quote, uncommon, according to a new study in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Researchers found that transmission of SARS-CoV-2 in the 10 school districts studied during the 2020 to 2021 school years was largely associated with greater lower socioeconomic status. Chief Infection Control Officer for Tufts Medicine Health System and Hospital, epidemiologist at Tufts Medical Center, Dr. Shira Darone, joins us now to help break down these findings. Thank you so much for coming on, Dr. Darone. So nice to be with you. So let's get right into it. A lot of the initial data during uh, COVID in schools showed that there was relatively low transmission. We didn't know uh, if this finding would hold up until this point, looking back on COVID in schools and, and the data and the numbers and what they show. Can you break down some of these findings, just what we're finding about the transmission of COVID in schools in Massachusetts where the study was conducted? Sure, so just um, to fully disclose before we begin, I am from Massachusetts. I was a formal advisor to the governor of Massachusetts during the COVID response, and I worked with the commissioner of education on safe school reopening policies. And in that context, I did interact with some of these study authors, but I was not involved in this study in any way. So this was a study that was designed to look specifically at secondary transmission within schools, meaning for every COVID case identified in a student or staff member in a school, what's the likelihood that infection will then occur in somebody else or be transmitted to somebody else. So they looked really carefully at the contact tracing data from 10 Massachusetts school district over two time periods during the early phase of the pandemic. This is before Omicron. And they found that that rate was less than 3%. So to put into context, out of more than 33,000 students plus staff in the first phase of the study, there were 435 index cases of COVID, people who had COVID while in school, 1,771 contacts identified, and only 29 possible or probable school-associated transmission events, which is very reassuring. Yeah, I mean, what this suggests to me is that what a lot of the public health bureaucrats were saying at the time about schools being super spreader locations was not accurate. And so I'd love to hear your perspective working with the governor there in Massachusetts. What were some of the recommendations you made at the time so that kids could go to school safely? Yeah, uh, many of us in the healthcare and epidemiology community were strongly advocating for a full reopening of schools in that fall of 2020. Uh, we had pandemic plans in place uh, that were designed to address the possibility of a respiratory virus pandemic in the United States. And those plans included keeping things as normal as possible for school children so that their parents could go to work in healthcare settings so that those students would be in a controlled environment, so that they would be cared for, so that they would be able to get lunches, um, you know, all of those things. Um, what we saw that break down and we saw some really negative consequences. And in the end, when we look back, those schools were not super spreader events and those schools would have been a much safer place for our children. This particular public policy issue garnered a lot of public attention and outcry, reasonably so, right? Parents really want to protect their kids. They're quite worried about their kids getting this virus. We didn't have a lot of data about what spreading looks like. It makes sense. Many parents are risk averse when it comes to their children's health. On the other hand, there are a lot of children of working people who didn't have the supplies necessary to facilitate a school from home scenario, whether it's Wi-Fi, whether it's computers, or just uh, child care, just to have someone at, at home with the child to make sure they are attending their classes and the tech is going smoothly. So it makes it a especially difficult decision when it comes to public health. Can you just talk through a little bit how you took in early data to make those decisions or recommendations that you made? Yeah, I mean, you know, working in Massachusetts, we did have very robust contact tracing data uh, that, that showed where infections were occurring. Um, and they were occurring in people's homes uh, predominantly. Um, and so the idea that you would, you know, force children to stay at home instead of being in that much more controlled environment of a classroom, often with uh, children from different households mixing for the sake of childcare or for the sake of forming these learning pods, 
um, you know, it was really actually backwards uh, from what the, uh, the response needed to be. Um, you know, when I thought about the possibility of a pandemic before the year 2020, uh, I, I never envisioned that these types of decisions would become so politicized. I never envisioned that we would really throw out our plans and do something completely different from what we had set out to do in all the decades of pandemic planning that I've been involved with. Dr. Darone, you've also spoken about some of the punitive attitudes towards children in schools, whether because they weren't vaccinated or didn't wear masks. I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about the attitude that that might have on a child's psyche, as well as the learning loss that so many children across the country experience due to school closures. Yeah, well, in my role uh, advising school reopening, and I, I did consult for several uh, schools in, in different types of settings, one of the things I heard a lot was about the punishments that children were uh, being subjected to, um, the, the chastising that uh, they were experiencing if their masks slipped below their nose. Um, you know, one of the worst parts was this concept of silent lunch, where when children had to take their masks off to eat, they were told to face a wall or not speak. Um, you know, none of that was evidence-based. Um, and none of that, I think, was humane. Um, but I understand where it came from. It came from a place of fear. Uh, and, and we did not handle that, the, we didn't handle the messaging around COVID and its uh, relatively uh, low impact on uh, young people. Uh, and we did not handle the fear. And instead we stoked the fires of panic throughout those early days and months of the pandemic. And fear-based decision-making is never good decision-making and nowhere was it more apparent than in the case of our school children. Now, Dr. Drone, I don't know how familiar you are with the study, if you've read it, but is there anything to say about its external validity that potentially what we observed in Massachusetts here with COVID spreading among children in schools that was mostly happening in the home instead is that true in other states and other parts of the country? Well, you know, Massachusetts was like many parts of the country in that it began with um, closed schools in the spring of 2020. Um, and then uh, in the fall of 2020, some schools remained closed, some schools were hybrid, and some schools were fully open. Um, so in that sense, you can apply it to many parts of the country. Um, here in Massachusetts, we were um, pretty aggressive with our mitigation strategies. So masks were mandatory for a very long time. Um, and there was a lot of attention to things like distancing. Um, and in some cases, um, but this, you know, likely differed greatly across socioeconomic uh, uh, statuses of, of districts, um, there was attention to ventilation. Um, and so it is interesting that in this study, one of the factors that increased, that seemed to increase the risk of transmission was if the contact um, and expo the, the exposed person was in a district that was more socioeconomically vulnerable. Um, so that is certainly something to keep in mind going forward, um, that, that that socioeconomic impact of COVID uh, is, is definitely a thread that we've seen throughout several studies. We've known for quite a while that healthy children were at relatively low risk of severe infection or death from COVID-19, but there was expressed concern about the potential for children to spread the virus to potentially vulnerable adults, whether staff members at the school or other individuals who were present. Is there any indication in this study um, of how many of these secondary instances were spread among staff versus other students? Yeah, I mean, you know, o overall, we're talking about very, very tiny numbers. Right. Um, and so, you know, that is a very good thing. Yes, uh, it, as we were advocating for a full reopening of schools, knowing that children were at low risk, one of the big arguments was, uh, but they could carry COVID home to their households. Um, and, you know, what this tells you is that um, they were very unlikely to acquire COVID in school. And uh, what we know from other studies is they were more likely to acquire COVID from their own household. So again, you know, the safest place for them uh, is again shown to be in the classroom. Dr. Drum, thank you so much for joining us today and breaking this down. We've got more rising after this. Thank you.